So um, let me welcome composer Ansel McDonald. Um, we're here to celebrate music, but to celebrate a particular artifact, and that is this uh, wonderful new CD. And uh, I want to congratulate Anselm on it. And uh, before I say anything about it to, to him, I just want to just commend it as a fantastic piece of work, which has, I mean, I know from brutal experience about producing these things. And the substance and quality and design of this, I think, is really fantastic. So you will not be surprised, given the context of tonight, that these are actually available at the end of the procedure for, I believe, 15 pounds. And so I uh, can't recommend it strongly enough. Music that is not always easy, but is always logical and repays a huge amount of listening. And I've already done a bit of repeated listening. So, um, Anselm, can I begin by just asking you about the practicalities of producing a CD? I mean, sometimes our priority is to get our work, our sort of best or favorite work together. Other times it's to collaborate with our favorite artists. I mean, what drove the, the content here for you? Um, well, I think the, the format of the CD kind of changed quite a bit since, since the initial idea. And that was mainly due to the pandemic, actually. Originally, the CD was going to be a collection of works which showed uh, a couple of different ensembles that I've written for, particularly choirs, but then obviously uh, singing uh, was curtailed massively um, during the first lockdown. So the album became much more about the pieces that uh, we were able to record during restrictions, which uh, was more for solo instruments, but then also the opportunities that uh, came up during the year. For example, the last piece on the album, uh, a cello suite for uh, the fantastic Martin Johnson, um, came about through um, a program run by the Contemporary Music Center in Dublin called the CMC Colleagues Program. So over the past year, the kind of work I've been writing has been much more for solo instruments and uh, duos and experimenting with electronics. And so everything kind of started coming together and I realized that it was going to be an album for solo instruments. But it was, it was later on during the process that I realized that was going to happen. It wasn't the initial thing I, that I'd actually set out to do. So, so the most recent music is, is kind of brand new. Um, what's the chronological span? I mean, what's the earliest? Uh... Um, so the earliest piece is from, I think, 2017, though I maybe started writing the piece in 2016, which is the Guitar Suite, which is a, a large 32-minute uh, suite for guitar, and it was the first piece that I started working on for my PhD. So for me, this album represents uh, the span of kind of solo music that I've written over the course of my career so far, because it, it goes back five years, but also all of these works are really my first attempts at writing for these instruments. Uh, both of the piano pieces on there are my first uh, pieces for solo piano, and then for the double bass and the cello also. Um, are, so it's really me finding, uh, finding my way to express my voice through solo instruments for the first time. Yeah, I like the idea of uh, the kind of 2017 being quite an early piece for you. I mean, as you get older, um, your early pieces get further away. And uh, so wait till you've got some from you know, the 1980s or something like that, or the equivalent. Um, but uh, you mentioned it, it being a, a, a suite. Um, I would particularly like to kind of commend this guitar suite to the, the, the listener for just as a personal selfish angle that, I mean, I remember sitting with you at a table and you showing me things in this piece on a sort of scrap of paper. And it's not often that as, a, as any kind of teacher or supervisor, you then get to go from that to the point where it's here in a fantastic performance. And you've kind of seen that whole span. And I think this is a really a substantial major achievement for guitar. So I want to congratulate you on that. But I want to ask, I mean, there are three works that we might call a suite on this disc. Um, I mean, it's not a sort of hugely fashionable kind of layout at a time when so often pieces are, are just a thing. It's just a piece. Um, I mean, 
what is it that you get from this idea of the collection of shorter pieces? It's not a coincidence that there are as many as three on this, no? Uh, no, um, so there's, well, there's kind of two reasons. One, one being that a lot of my music is very narrative-driven and based on stories. And so a suite for me lends itself to that particularly because I think of it as like different chapters of this narrative. And we have, you know, have taken the listener through this point um, and now we turn to another point in the story or another, uh, um, another angle on it. Um, the second, I think, is musical, that um, especially with the guitar pieces, there's a, a lot of experimenting with the sound of the guitar. And I felt that to do that all in a single piece might feel like cramming too many things, like you've taken all the sweets from the jar immediately. Um, but doing that over a longer period of time um, also challenged me to explore those sounds in real depth but then think about their context within a larger whole of a suite of pieces. Yeah, I'm just thinking back to works not on the disc uh, and wondering, are there long sustained pieces? I'm now thinking that some of your most substantial, continuous sort of one-off pieces um, often sort of seem to explore ways of getting out of uh, the sort of formal narrative by using chance elements or uh, that kind of thing. I mean, do you have a sort of a, an ongoing, I don't know, a sort of battle with the idea of the kind of long continuous narrative or is it just a matter of what, what comes up at the, for each project? Um, I think, I think a, li a little bit of both and particularly um, I have noticed with the guitar especially that the guitar lends itself very well to collections of shorter pieces. It's it's quite, it's rarer, I, I, I think, to have composers writing longer form pieces for the instrument uh, because it has a more limited dynamic range than say something like the piano. Um, and it, it just seems to lend itself to that more, I find. Yeah, having um, said that, you find the most extraordinary range of uh, colors and sounds and indeed <laughs> noises um, from within, it's entirely an acoustic piece, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, it has the feeling, as it opens quite gently, that we kind of gradually get in deeper to a kind of terrain. I mean, tell us a bit about the shape, because I know that it's, uh, it has a special kind of layout. Does it, it's not just a collection of seven pieces with different textures. Mm -hmm. So several of my pieces draw on... Uh, structures from literature and this particular piece draws on a structure in Hebrew poetry found a lot in the Psalms of the Old Testament uh, called a chiasm which is an arc structure. So the piece, the piece is formed in an arc structure with the fourth movement being the center but there are various ways that uh, the piece kind of reinforces those structures. For example there are particular intervals that are common to each movement. Uh, for example the first and the seventh seventh piece use similar intervals and then the second and the sixth and so on. Um, there's also a gradual movement towards the center of the suite and then away from the center, as you point out, towards um, the more noise aspects of the guitar yeah, the and the interesting and the timbre. Sixth maybe, yeah. Yes, yeah. And the, th the third and the fifth especially are really trying to uh, explore the different noises that I can get out of the instrument. So as you say, it, it is like uh, we take a deep dive um, in and then come back out to more familiar territory and more familiar techniques. Yeah. So the other suites, there's one for piano and there's one for cello with um, fixed media, I think fixed? Uh, it's live electronics. Live, I'm yes. sorry, live. Um, do they have a shape as well? Or, I mean, can a suite be just random for you? Or they, do you always landscape them in some way? Um, I always landscape them because when I'm thinking about how they'll be listened to, I, I imagine and I hope uh, that listeners will listen to the whole suite um, consecutively. Um, so I'm thinking about that journey that uh, people will be taking on when they're listening to it. So I do, I do very much think about the landscape and think about contrast uh, between the movements. And I think that's noticeable particularly in the, in the piano uh, suite where we move from a particularly violent um, opening uh, to something that resembles more of a prayer. Um, and in terms, of the, in terms of the cello suite, it was based on three phrases for uh, light um, that I found in the Irish language, taken from a book by an Irish journalist called Mancon Magan. And 
that piece for me is uh, about kind of the unfolding of time. It starts off uh, reflecting on um, Will of the Wisps, um, lights seen late at night over uh, the Irish bogland. Then we get a, a movement that reflects on uh, thunder in the middle of the night. And the last movement on that is, uh, is dawn, um, is the opening of the day. So actually, as we move through the suite, it's uh, like we're moving through the various stages of night. Yeah, so these, these are obviously highly, highly structured, however many of the movements. But um, several of the pieces use live electronics or maybe fixed media or combination. Um, I was very struck as a listener that I, it, well, I, I suppose I knew that in advance, but I was very struck that I wasn't really sort of paying attention to it. It crept in on me. I mean, is that an intention that it acts as a kind of, uh, as just an additional aspect in the sound world? Uh, very much. What, what's the yeah. kind of rationale, or is it different for each piece? I think it's maybe particular to this album of how I use electronics with solo instruments that um, I think of them as expanding the range of the instrument itself. So uh, the, there are electronics present on the piece for double bass and then also for uh, the cello. And both times they are sampling either live or pre-recorded um, extracts from the instrument. And I'm seeing them as a way of, you know, just pushing the boundaries of, or I guess the kind of limits of the range of what the instrument can do. Um, other, other pieces, maybe more chamber pieces, the electronics are, are more contributing as an additional instrument to the ensemble. But in, in this case particularly, I think they are an extension of the instrument. And that's why they creep in so yeah. gradually, because I don't want to reveal all the cards uh, right. straight off. I mean, particularly in the double bass piece, and obviously, Solo double bass is not a sound world that listener is likely to be as familiar with as, I don't know, maybe even solo guitar. And I think that if one had no knowledge of it, it would be a kind of, well, hold on, what was that kind of moment? Because initially it's just bass, isn't it? And it's a most extraordinarily subtle addition to the world of the piece. I think it's... That's also coming from pieces that I've particularly enjoyed are where electronics are used as a kind of sleight of hand by the composer. And you reach that point where you hear something and you suddenly think, oh, who, who made that sound? Was it the electronics or was it the instrument? Um, and so I enjoy those oral tricks that can be played by the addition of electronics. Now, obviously, that, that can work particularly well in a live performance because uh, you're seeing the instrumentalist playing, and you maybe see them. They don't take an action, but you hear a sound. Um, and so there's a lot. There's a lot, I feel, that can, be, that can be used with that. But predominantly, these are extended sounds rather than, say, multi-tracking. I mean, you're not trying to replicate the number of uh, uh, similar sounding instruments. You're not using it for additional. Um, well, it depends on the it depends you? on the piece. In the in mm -hmm. the double bass piece, for example, right at the very end, um, we gradually get a build up of the amount of tracks that are going on, and by the time by the time the piece ends, um, I think there's seven or eight different uh, different tracks of the instrument recording going on. Um, so there's gradually an opening out towards that. Uh, the cello piece, obviously, with the live electronics, um, is just sampling the single sound from the cello. Um, so is more um, is, is is isn't heading in that same direction of making the solo instrument become an ensemble. In the cello pieces, um, I don't have to say this is only based on one listening. Um, I was kind of staggered by the range of expression between uh, kind of noise at one end and very uh, familiar cello territory at the other. I mean, it seems an extraordinary. Um, sort of powerful kind of expressive range in a not very long piece. I mean, how do you, is that part of the structure of like, because one of them is eight, but two of them are eight minutes, aren't yes. they? Yes, yeah. Do you think in terms of moving away from and back to the cello sound as part of what the, you know, what the piece's course is? Um, I, I think so, but also more generally, I, I, I feel that that is a particular signifier of my compositional voice. Um, particularly during the PhD, I felt it was something that I was wrestling with, was that I really enjoyed writing flowing melodic lines and rich harmonies, and, but then I, 
I also was enjoying at the same time these more no noise-based textures and exploring extended instrument sounds. And I hadn't heard a lot of music that was trying to meld those two worlds. I was hearing pieces that were either in the one or in the other. And so I feel that uh, it's become a particularly important thread in my work that I am exploring how I might marry these two things together. And I think some of the pieces on the album do that more successfully than others, but um, it's certainly an aspect that I'm, that, that's what I'm very interested in. Yeah, and I'm not even sure it's two worlds. I mean, it seems to me a continuum. Um, and we travel that, I mean, quite uh, astonishingly in the cello pieces. And uh, I, I, I was going to ask you particularly about two pieces here. One, well, one was the last movement of the, the cello suite because it seems to emerge to a kind of uh, more kind of familiar resolution in terms of sound world. Is, is, is that connected to light? Uh, yes. Yeah, um, as, as, you, as you said, uh, I, I think about these things a lot on continuum as heading towards noise, pulling back to pitch or normal techniques. Um, I mean, the, the, the very last uh, movement of the cello suite is based on uh, Bach. Um, and so it's a very, very familiar cello territory, as and you, you don't as you said. do that. You're, you're, that's part of the whole. Yes, and um, I was interested again in how do I take this. Um, because my, my own background was um, uh, as a rock guitarist. So actually, when I came to university, I was experiencing a lot of this music simultaneously. You know, I was listening to Bach and Beethoven and Burt Whistle, you know, uh, and you know, the, it was all, a lot of it was very new to me. And so I'm trying to take from all those things that I enjoyed, whether they're, whether it's music that's extremely old or music that was only written yesterday. And I'm interested in how can I incorporate these things that inspire me and that I enjoy into my compositional voice and make them mine. Absolutely. I mean, the range of expressive places on this recording is really remarkable, I think. And, uh, you know, it can't be encompassed by just listening a couple of times. I mean, I've just scratched the surface and I knew one or two of the pieces already. But, uh, you know, I think it's... Uh, it's a kind of research document in that way. Let's finish by talking about the piano pieces, which are, they are the most, no, not quite the most uh, recent. No, the cello, the cello suite is the most recent, yeah. but I wrote the piano suite just before it. Right, right. So I wanted to ask you particularly about the second piece because it surprises me every time I hear it, which is twice so far. Um, first movement starts off with a terrific kind of stomping, you know, uh, pianistic figuration. Second movement is kind of like a prayer or a folk song, or what is it? Yes, yeah, so it's it's, it's taken. Quoting something. It, it is. It's uh, the tune is a tune called Saint Patrick's Breastplate, okay. oh, um, well, which a is hymn a, tune, yeah. yes, a hymn tune, a very familiar Irish tune. Um, yeah. It's a it's a tune that I learned from singing with a, a choir. Yeah. And I sing with Grosvenor Chorale, um, and that tune just really arrested me, and I really wanted to explore it in a contemporary idiom. Um, but, I, but I quote it pretty much uh, uh, verbatim throughout um, that short piece. And for me, that highlighted an extreme moment of contrast between the first movement, but also a connection to the third, because the third movement is um, very rhythmically ambiguous and quite exploratory in the sound world. And when I was working on the piece, uh, to me, those two movements, the first and the third, didn't sit well uh, up against each other. There was just something about it that um, didn't seem to work. And the insertion of that small second movement, I yeah. felt, helped Again, you the think transition. so carefully about the sort of architectonics yes, of, a, yes, exactly. of a suite. Yes, And the last movement starts out stomping. And it finishes in the same vein, but in between, there's something completely different. Yeah, so the last movement, uh, Alban Heffen, Light of Shore, is uh, based on kind of, uh, druidic rituals and uh, around the summer solstice. And my idea, again, was light, and you'll, you'll have noticed that light is a very present theme on the album. Um, and this idea of something that gradually opened out um, to me at the end of the suite was quite appealing. So. Um, I think it's, th there's a couple of pieces on the album that stand out for me. This is one I especially enjoy because I really push myself to explore just one thing, that most of that movement is based only on fifths and right. what I could do with that. 
Um, it, it, takes some, it takes some inspiration from a piece by uh, Henry Coyle called The Tides of Monotony. Um, it opens in a very similar way and then ends in a similar way that this movement does with a kind of hymn tune right down at the very bottom of the piano where it's so murky that you almost can't hear it. Um, so, yes, I've run out of things to say on that piece. <laughs> Indeed. Well, that sounds like a good cue for, for hearing it. So, um, once again, to recommend the disc, to say it's available outside, and to thank Anselm for his words and to congratulate him and... Uh, uh, then we shall introduce our guest artist for tonight. So, Ansel, many congratulations, and thank you for sharing all those thoughts with us. Thank you, Pierce.